wanted to welcome you all. It's great to have it, an opportunity to see you in the spring and for such a great occasion. This is a postponed conclusion of the fall speaker series, the, um, the Investment Law Policy Speaker Series, which is co-organized by the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, the Columbia Center on International Commercial and Investment Arbitration, um, and sponsored by Carl and Waring and Baker and McKenzie. And we're really excited to have all of our partners and actually quite distinguished guests in the room too. Um, but without any further ado, let me turn it over to Ian to introduce our speaker. Hi, uh, <clears throat> I'm Ian Laird. Um, I'm uh, at Kroll and Mooring, and we're one of the sponsors of this, of this event. And I just wanted to uh, introduce our speaker today for the, this last edition of uh, our speaker series uh, for this uh, year. Uh, it's a real privilege to have Professor Ro Robert House. Uh, he's the Lloyd C. Nelson Professor of International Law at uh, NYU Law School. Uh, Professor House uh, has, I would have to say, is one of our leaders in the field of international economic law. His experience in world trade law, uh, the WTO, and international investment law is wide and, and very deep. And it, of course, it's a very big privilege and honor to have him here today to talk about a very uh, current and uh, contentious topic uh, we saw in the uh, in the fall the uh, introduction of a proposal by the European uh, Commission um, to, for a new investment chapter with a new model for dispute resolution. And so Rob, is, uh, Professor House has uh, very uh, graciously agreed to come and talk to us about that in particular, um, and his topic is titled, Courting the Critics of Investor State Dispute Settlement, the EU Proposal for a Judicial System for Investment Disputes. So um, that I'm looking very much forward to his discussion, and uh, I'll turn over the mic to uh, Professor House. Thank you, Rob. Uh, th thanks a lot, Ian. Uh, so first of all, uh, huge apologies for being uh, late. Um, it, 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 I, I, I have to take a cab up here maybe once a year, and that always turns out to be uh, a disaster if uh, one doesn't take the, the subway. But um, so uh, anyhow, uh, I'm going to be extremely brief since uh, I've managed to uh, waste some of your uh, time already. Uh, the proposal that the EU developed for a judicial system for investor state dispute settlement emerged out of um, growing criticism of investor state arbitration uh, uh, in Europe, uh, both by uh, uh, government officials in some member states and also by the public. There was a, a, consult a public consultation, and a huge number of people wrote in with extremely negative views of investor state uh, arbitration. Uh, so ultimately, the parliament, when it gave its marching orders to the uh, EU negotiators for TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, basically uh, said uh, a, a, using traditional or conventional investor state arbitration for uh, investment dispute settlement in TTIP is, is not acceptable to this, uh, to this parliament. And so that uh, you know, gave a, a uh, mandate and indeed a challenge uh, to the European Commission uh, to uh, to figure out some alternative, thank you, uh, to propose uh, uh, to uh, investor state dispute settlement. Now, of course, many critics said we don't need any international or transnational forum to settle investment disputes between the EU and the United States. I mean, we're dealing with a group of countries uh, whose legal systems, whose constitutional systems are based on uh, the rule of law, where um, there's an, there are independent uh, judiciaries. And so, so uh, between these countries, why would disputes ever need to be taken up to an international panel or body? Why, don't we, why can't we trust uh, domestic law? Now, that point of view, I think, was not broadly, was viewed from the get-go by the commission as, to say the least, unlikely to be acceptable to the United States, its negotiating partner. So the commission came up with um, something new and interesting, which was to say we will have an international forum uh, for resolving these disputes, but it will be a judicial system. It will be a judicial system with features such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, a standing uh, collegial body of judges, an appellate tribunal, um, uh, transparency, 
uh, a strict conflict of interest rules that addresses many of the more specific as opposed to broad side attacks on investor state arbitration. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, the um, DG Trade uh, announced the proposal, she said that um, it reflects a fundamental lack of trust in, in the existing system of investor state arbitration. And at that moment, the official position of the European Commission, in effect, became that there is a fundamental lack of trust in the existing system. So in a way, there's no going back to investor state arbitration as far as the EU is concerned. There are only two options going forward, either uh, investment or trade and investment agreements negotiated between the EU and other states will have a judicial system in them, or they will not have uh, a, an international instance or forum for the settlement of investment disputes. The, those disputes will be settled in, in domestic courts, uh, even if uh, those domestic courts might be required to apply certain international or expected to apply uh, certain international norms. Now, I think there are a number of features of the, um, uh, uh, of the EU proposal that actually do, in a, in a positive and constructive way, address valid criti critiques uh, of the system of investor state arbitration. First of all, qualifications of arbitrators. Believe it or not, there is no professional qualification required of investment arbitrators. If you have friends bringing an investment dispute, uh, or uh, uh, are your friends with their counsel, you can become an arbitrator. There's zero qualifications essentially required to become an arbitrator. That's, that's a shocking reality. It's, 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 it's shocking to all of my colleagues who have never worked in this area to hear that that's the case. And, and what happens is the quality control occurs through a private club technique where basically if somebody is regarded as having the royal jelly or the right stuff, they're admitted to the club, they get to arbitrate. If the results look good or nice or plausible to other members of the club, they get more arbitrations and, and so on. And so this very quickly resembles not uh, jurisprudence constant by an independent judiciary, but uh, you know, a web of ad hoc rulings, often inconsistent with, with one another, where the lack of, of scrutiny and rigor is often just a product of the fact that, of, of this self-referential clique, that in a way is judging for itself. They judge themselves. And, and the, the epitome of that is the ICSID uh, annulment process, which is supposed to be able to correct in the case of investor state arbitration under X and correct for uh, you know, crazy uh, decisions. And who are the correctors? They're almost all drawn from exactly the same clique uh, as the people who do, who do uh, the, uh, the, the original uh, uh, arbitrations. Um, you know, so, so it's a lot of backpacking, it's a bat, a back padding, it's a mutual admiration society, and how can that really be a process that will generate legitimacy where you can go to a state and say to that state that this is a, a, a rigorous legal judgment uh, by independent persons uh, who are uh, under rigorous uh, uh, scrutiny, have rigorous professional credentials, and, and are, 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 are bound by rigorous conflict of interest uh, uh, requirements, and, and say that, um, you know, say that you've got to, to the taxpayers of that country, the legislature, we now have to pay out $40 million. But, but we don't have professional qualifications. We don't have serious conflict of interest rules. We have the two hat problem, the absolutely insane situation where somebody can be an arbitrator in one case where they are counsel in another case where a similar legal issue is at stake. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, if a first year law student would not understand why that state of affairs is not acceptable, I would say that there, we would, at NYU, would have a problem with the, uh, with the kind of professional responsibility we're teaching our students. So the EU proposal uh, you know, has features that overcome all of these difficulties. Um, 
And because I'm, I'm late and I want to get a discussion going, and most of you are very informed about these things, uh, I'm not going to say much more uh, uh, than that. Uh, I will uh, respond to a few of the criticisms. One of the major criticisms that has come out of the uh, arbitration clique is the notion that this system, the, the judicial system, that you know, uh, gets rid of quote unquote party autonomy, which is a fancy word for saying that, that a party, the, the parties get to choose the judges. Well, why should we have party autonomy? It seems in, in commercial arbitration, it's understandable. Two commercial parties, two private parties, want to decide a problem, a, a, a dispute among themselves in an, in, an, in an amicable, or at least if not amicable, at least a way in which both can accept the results. So yes, so party autonomy might make sense. But what is investor state arbitration? It's basically about public law. It's about judging the conduct of, of a state or state officials against standards of public international law. And, it, and it's, it's much more akin to administrative law review or in some legal systems constitutional review of government action. And in those cases, if, if, uh, if a company has an environmental case uh, or, um, or a securities case before the regulator and then before the courts in the United States, do, do they say it's unfair because we don't get to choose one of the judges? or one of the members of the Securities Commission adjudicating or, or uh, deciding the claim? Of course not. Uh, you know, when we're dealing with public law and, 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 and cases that are basically about judging the conduct of, uh, of, of government officials and, and, and government agencies against public law standards, we don't really think that the claimant has an entitlement to choose their judge. So I, I don't see why we should, we should think that's a problem with the EU proposal. The more subtle version is the notion that if you don't have corporations or quote unquote you know, investors involved in the selection of the judges, that states will habitually choose judges who are pro-state, who will not, who, who will be deferential to, to government action. But if you look at the European Court of Human Rights, and if you look at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, who appoints the judges to those courts? The very countries whose, whose policies and practices are being judged by the judges. And, 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 and overall, I can, uh, it's certainly the case, uh, and you can see this because there's pushback against judicial act, quote unquote, judicial activism in these courts, it's certainly the case that, that these judges have few compunctions about, about, about uh, 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 deciding where they think rights have been violated in favor uh, uh, of the claimant and against states, including the states that, that the, the very states that appoint them. So I think this is a rather trivial uh, and, and, and tendentious uh, criticism. It doesn't really go to the nature of, of what investment law is, which is a form of public law that limits, uh, uh, you know, or, or constrains the conduct of, of states according to certain public norms. Uh, in this case, uh, reflected in international responsibility, not just in domestic constitutional uh, uh, or administrative law uh, systems. This being said, and, and one of the developments since I wrote the paper that just happened today or yesterday is a group of German judges uh, issued a statement that they are concerned that, that the appointment process in the original EU proposal is not rigorous enough. They think the professional qualifications ought to be expanded to include expertise in areas of municipal law. I think that makes sense. And, and it goes to whether there should not be some kind of committee, whether strictly just party appointment without some kind of filter of a committee. And if you had a committee, then if you wanted to reinsure the investor community, you could have a broad range of stakeholders on that committee. The ultimate decision as to who's appointed to the court uh, would, would still rest in the hands of the state's parties, but, but, but the committee would play a big role in vetting uh, persons nominated by, by states' parties. 
Um, uh, another criticism, ironically, is because there's a pellet body that this will create additional costs and delays. I say ironically because if you look at the time, uh, uh, because currently we don't have any specified time frames. It's, or, or cost limitations, basically, uh, overall. So if you're advising a client, you have to tell them, uh, we don't know how much the arbitrators are going to ask you to pay for an award. Uh, we have some idea of their hourly fee, but if they tell us they need another 200 hours to produce an award, you know, if, you don't, if we don't give them their whatever $1,000 an hour for the 200 hours, we're not going to get an award. And then we can't be sure of when we get an award because, believe it or not, there are no enforceable norms uh, as to the, the acceptable uh, delay in, in getting an award. Now, the, the EU proposal actually has time frames uh, where if uh, a tribunal cannot give an award within that particular period of time, um, it, it has at least to give an explanation and, and, to, uh, and to give a clear indication of when the award will be available. Uh, that's a big improvement over the existing system. The costs uh, rules uh, and practices are not entirely worked out, but I think it's going to be moving much more towards a system where there's salary remuneration, which is likely to considerably reduce the costs that we currently have to pay uh, arbitrators, who are very expensive, who are often unavailable, and ultimately often just give sloppy awards. So the, uh, this is a tighter system, it's going to be cheaper, and you're going to have some discipline on the delays involved in, um, in, getting, uh, in getting judgments out of uh, the system. And I think these are all positive things, and in fact, if you calculate the average time it takes to go through the, si the current system and get a, a, a final uh, award, uh, even not including possible enforcement time, it's actually considerably longer than, 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 than the, the, the time limits for both the first instance and the appellate process as uh, envisaged by the EU in this proposal. So it's actually much better uh, on, on the front of delays and costs, and I just you know, find it completely specious when people in the arbitration clique say that because there's going to be appellate review, it necessarily follows that this is going to be a longer and more expensive uh, process. So I'm just a, a final word. Um, now uh, this this proposal is a reality, not yet in TTIP, but it's a reality, as many of you will know, in the EU Vietnam Agreement. I brought the text of the agreement with me in case any of you are interested in exploring the way in which the court proposal has been incorporated into that agreement. My understanding also uh, is that is that the Trudeau government in Canada is open to. Uh, uh, some version of the proposal being backloaded into the uh, Canada-EU trade agreement, uh, although exactly in what form, it's, it's, it's not yet uh, clear. And uh, I put my two cents in with uh, uh, the minister, who some of you may know from her days as a, um, as a journalist and, and, and writer in New York, uh, uh, that in fact uh, that's what Canada ought to do in this particular case. Uh, um, so uh, let's open the floor up. And again, apologies for the delay. I hope this is uh, a, a contra what I've said is provocative enough to get uh, some kind of uh, lively discussion going. Yeah. I think I think that that overall the critics would be happiest with simply dropping it, dropping investor state dispute settlement altogether, and 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 you know many many of the NGOs in Europe who were uh, critical of having investor state arbitration and whom the Commission thinks it's responding to have in turn uh, said we're not satisfied by this. We still we we'd still prefer not to have any investor state arbitration. But of course, many of those groups also would prefer not to have TTIP at all. So, and I think if I'm asked to follow up to that, yeah, okay. I, I think so.
Uh, uh, yes, and in fact, my original response, I think, was that many of the, the some of the groups in question don't want TTIP, you know, at all. But on the but the uh, the concerns are not related to you know environmental type I issues because and and certainly the you know the the Philip Morris case uh, you know un until it was thrown out on jurisdictional grounds uh, you know was you know, a kind of exhibit A uh, for those who th think that investor state dispute settlement, you know, is a threat to um, the environment um, or public health. And, and, and then now, um, you know, as uh, to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, to make up for that, as it were, we have a new case. The, I, I think, uh, like Philip Morris, it's not a meritorious case, which is the the uh, the Keystone Pipeline case um, against uh, the United States. So, you know, okay. Um, fortunately for the the people who are, are saying that investor state dispute settlement is a threat to environmental protection, it, it was merely weeks after or less after the uh, you know uh, Philip Morris was thrown out on jurisdiction that 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 Keystone launched uh, its um, its its NAFTA its NAFTA challenge and you know and also there's a mischaracterization of other awards including in the interest of disclosure some where I have uh, worked for the investors council as cases that were lost uh, by the environment whereas in fact what was going on was not it was not that you know the investor was you know was subject to normal environmental regulation but in some way an environmental regime was uh, was misused or or abused uh, in a political way uh, to stop the investment, and the motivations were quite of the government were quite were quite you know uh, suspect, or the rule of law in the framework was not followed. It, just because there are environmental facts doesn't mean that the governmental conduct, you know, is 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 conduct that could be justified on an on an objective basis as in the service of environmental protection. So there's a complicated issue here. But the more that people, the more that investors bring these kinds of claims like Philip Morris and Keystone, um, you know, the more that this argument is kept alive that there's, that there's a real threat. George. without this new system. So one thing I'd really like to know is um, whether you can identify what it, what it was about TTIP, um, what it is about having the US as a partner, that, as distinct from Singapore and Canada, that might have explained this sort of schizophrenia, at least it appears to. Uh, it's, it's, it's purely tempor temporal. Yeah, it's temporal. Uh, that, that the, the CETA negotiations um, uh, the, the, the approach to investment in the CETA negotiations, um, the Canadian negotiations, uh, uh, you know, had uh, had been developed uh, a lot earlier before, you know, the events that led to the EU proposals. So, you know, and, and yeah, and and as I say, um, the Commission, as I understand it, you know, uh, ha, you know is in, engaged in discussions with Canada uh, and backloading it. Um, I also understand. Uh, my understanding also is that is that Singapore may be open to this, uh, and, um, and and New Zealand also has indicated that it that it is. So um, there may be some amount of rewriting or or, or rejigging of those of those treaties, uh, you know, uh, uh, that will bring them in line. But 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 I do not think, and and I've I've actually talked to. Um, some of the people most involved in the commission on this issue, like Colin Brown, I do not think that the logic of the commission was that this was something particularly necessary or desirable because of the U.S. being the, the negotiating partner.
you would sort of understand it from from a reporter, from the idea that it would be easy in a fashion in a direction that the population has rallied against, I think is, is inconceivable. It would be even true. And I'm wondering what you think about the relative, um, how should I say, from a U.S. perspective, how negotiable um, is this? Um, is the U.S., because there is a, a, an attachment to ISDS as, as you know it, yeah. on the U.S. side. Curious to know whether you think it's as firm um, as, as the EU is. And did you imply in your answer very curiously that if no agreement could be reached, we could have a Q-tip without the I? No, no, I meant without, uh, it could, there could be investment norms, okay. but, but they, they would be subject either to state-to-state -state dispute okay. settlement or, or, or you, you might have a clause that says that domestic courts uh, uh, shall be uh, directed to respect these norms or to allow a remedy, you know. And, and, and that you can have. Like, if you look at the intellectual property provisions uh, in the WTO agreement, it actually says that, the, that WTO members commit themselves to make a domestic court remedy available in certain circumstances to holders of intellectual property. So you could have a clause in TTIP that says that, that you know, there, there shall be a, a remedy uh, uh, through independent judicial body in, in each member state for a violation of fair and equitable treatment, expropriation without compensation, and 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 so forth. Uh, and on the U.S. side, you know, I I, I would, and in fact, this is what I'm going to talk about at the uh, at the European Foreign Investment Law and Arbitration meeting tomorrow in Paris, where I'm also talking about this paper. I'm going to focus more on the U.S. perspective, and and I would say two things. One is, you know, people talk about United States exceptionalism. One element of that exceptionalism is apparently, and this keeps getting repeated by defenders of investor state arbitration, including. President Obama, uh, is that the U.S. has never lost a case. So, you know, there, that, that exceptionalism, I think, drives the fact that the range of constituencies in the United States who are up in arms about ISDS is somewhat narrower uh, than in, in other places where, where the effect of having lost cases or had to settle cases for a considerable amount of money, and, and I mean, this is a part of the story about Europe because of what happened in Germany, right? in a case that did have some, I think, environmental dimensions to it, um, you know, if, you, if, you, if, you've, if you've lost or had, you know, to settle in such a way as to limit your policies or pay a lot of money, that focuses your mind on, on you know, on, on this and, and, and focuses a wider range of constituencies on it. So, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the EU, for the reason you gave, is not going to be able to go back and put standard investor state arbitration in, uh, you know, back in. Um, at most, I could imagine a compromise where um, there could be an election, so that so, so that American investors could elect to to go to arbitration at the first instance. But then that that would be subject to an appellate body that's that's part and parcel of the court. So there might be some compromise possible, but it, but it's all subject to the degree of political will, how determined the relevant constituencies are to get TTIP through, and other constituencies are uh, to block it. And that's a much bigger story, right? Uh, the, the, yeah. Well, they're they're. Yeah, they're 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 powerful, but but what do you think they would say if 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 the U.S. negotiators of TTIP came back to them and said, well, here are the three options: there no TTIP, uh, TTIP with um, uh, a judicial system, TTIP with with no international settlement of investment disputes at all, because I think those are the choices. Yeah, and and so once those choices are read back to them as the only choices, what are they what are they likely to prefer in the end. Well, you know, I think the bar of the U.S. Senate yeah. stated twice. No TTIP, in other words. No, yeah. no um, TTIP with ISDS would be the way. No, but, but I mean, the, I, don't, I think for the reason you suggest, that's off the table. It's yeah. not even a, a negotiable position for yeah, the... I think, um, frankly, I think your hybrid strategy is the best. 
And, and, you know, it's consistent with U.S. policies because U.S. policy has been for some time to to include clauses in, in investment agreements that foresee the future possibility of negotiating an appellate mechanism. So, I mean, the EU could turn to the U.S. and say, you've been putting this in agreements. Are you just lying through your teeth? Or, you know, or how can you now suddenly say we won't even have an appellate mechanism? Um, Michael? Yeah, I, I think I think I think that's true, and and I think that the commission um, understood that that they had to you know that they had to basically be credible that this is a fait accompli, otherwise you know they would be thrown to the sharks, and 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 in a way you know it's it's not a trivial thing that it's now actually in an agreement, and, and you might say like how many investment disputes are there going to be between you and Vietnam, but the thing is going to be set up. And it's going to be functional, and and if it can be functional in one context, it can be functional uh, in another. And in a way, also the proposal, much like Plato's Republic, uh, if I can make what might seem like an odd analogy, is as important for for the implicit criticism of the existing system as for whether any of its specific institutional features are are adopted. And when you have uh, you know, a group of countries, the EU, who represent probably historically almost dominant players in the investment treaty uh, game, saying that there is a that there is such a fundamental lack of trust in the existing system that we have to jump to this new model. I mean, that that you know, that's different from some NGO saying, "Oh, investor state arbitration is harmful to the environment," or that that particular award represents corporate interests. I mean, to have the weight of a group of states like the EU behind the position that the existing system is illegitimate is is is, is as I say, I think almost as important, and maybe in the long run even more important than the proposal itself. Yeah. Yes, yes. Piss off about uh, Acnea, where, where you know, the EU Commission said this are not accomplished between the EU and Ireland, where that was a minute. Uh, uh, the Germany one uh, is. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And I wonder about the last aspect of the minute. Yeah, so that's been emphasized a lot by activists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, uh, that's that's become a real concern of public officials in, in in a number of EU states, not just a concern of, you know, of activists. And, and, and do you think there is an anger that uh, the, the arbitration process might be more aimed at buyers for self-regulation rather than the community? I, I don't think that people became familiar with the community until they started to lose cases or their or or their country started to lose cases. And then when you start to lose cases, you ask uh, who are, are the characters who, who wrote this award? And you look at the award, and maybe you get some senior judge 
constitutional judge or administrative judge, uh, tell us what this means. This is very strangely reasoned. What are these norms? So you go to maybe the, you know, it's because it's international law, maybe you go to a, a judge who's also been a professor of international constitutional law. And the judge looks at this, this award, and, and this doesn't look like a, a rigorous piece of jurisprudence at all to that judge. So then you ask, who were the people who produced this award? And what was the system that got them appointed? And why is it final and not subject to review or correction by the highest court in this country, which is the guardian of our constitution? And so it's through that chain of, of, of consciousness raising that I think often begins with losing a case or, or one's government settling a case in a way that seems very problematic, that, that then you find out more and more about how the system works. And, and as an outsider, you start getting quite shocked or concerned about what's going on. There is no, no consensus among people who do this counter work that says this is a wonderful system. People are not, uh, that there are clearly issues of cost and delay. Now, everybody realizes that the case that I tried three weeks ago with these six people, it's not a good case for anybody. It's not a good thing for Russia, it's an expropriation case, it's a family business, it's a social case. Nobody has time for that. Not anybody. And the state points out in that case, which is not well, it depends on the state, perhaps. Well, but, you know, um, the states think this is an efficient system, and we wouldn't have you know, what the House saying what he's saying without states. And that, in fact, that's a Dutch and Venezuelan group, the Farmer Administration, who are protecting this situation. The, and a lot of us, this is another point I want to make, a lot of us represent both investors and states. And it's something we sort of have to keep hat. So the case that we tried in November, we represented the state. The case that I tried two weeks ago represented the investor. Both cases involved regulation of accounting. A lot of the same cases are being argued um, by the clients in both cases. This is a case in which the Supreme Court said you have to take this case to the Court of Equity Law. Why am I necessarily disabled? Well, I, 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 as I say, I think it's, I think it's, you know, fairly obvious that, and it, it might be a temporal thing. I mean, you could devise a hypothetical where, you know, you had already, you know, completed your work as counsel, uh, and, and then you go on to be arbitrator, and so there's no possibility of, of your judgment being influenced. I think it's a perception. Of, it, of impartiality. I mean, I I find I find it very hard, you know, to disassociate, you know, views that I develop as an advocate on a certain issue uh, at a particular time, from uh, from how one would view that issue uh, as uh, as an arbitrator. In the one case, you you have a clear interest uh, uh, in rep in a particular position in representing your client. In the other case, you're making an interpretation as an arbitrator that will affect, you know, uh, the, at least hypothetically, the view taken uh, about the proper interpretation in the later case where you're counsel. Now, I mean, if you've done all your counsel, you said, okay, I'm, I'm finished with counsel work, and now I'm going to be an arbitrator. I don't think it's necessarily a conflict to say, oh, this person, you know, took all these positions on these issues as counsel, and therefore now they can't be an arbitrator because they have fixed positions that, uh, that they took in previous cases as counsel. As long as those cases are finished and you say, I'm going to wash my hands, and in fact the EU proposal permits that. If you give up counsel work, you can be on the court. 
there are a lot of people who work for both states, uh, employees who work for both states and investors. Right. So why does this necessarily prohibit us from acting as an investor, as, a, acting as, as an arbitrator? I, I, I think you're confusing two different issues. One issue is, you know, um, it, or is there an inherent conflict of interest in, in representing uh, investors in states where similar legal issues are at stake uh, and where in the one case as an advocate you would take one kind of position um, uh, when you're representing an investor and as an advocate for a state you would take a different position. And I, I don't think so. I think that's part of what you know uh, what is involved in being a barrister. Now, now you know, but but at the same time, of course, you know, y you would necessarily I disclose to both clients that you're working for the other client. And so, you know, I think part of the concern is taken care of there, you know, just by just by d you know disclosure. But but I, but advocacy, I think. There's an implicit norm that advocacy is is advocacy, and and that an advocate is there to make the best case uh, about what the law says from you know for their client's uh, interests, of course, within other ethical constraints. An arbitrator should not be swayed by by considerations of a, any client's interest, and so and so that's the that's the distinction. I don't see and that's why I don't see an intrinsic problem in the one case, and I see an overwhelming problem in the other situation. when they're advocates, um, but um, there could be a perception, well, in the future, you could carve out an investor side practice if you want to, if you want to uh, advocate for, you could have investor side advocacy practice for investor side arbitrate or practice, you know, it's, so or I, you I, could I, just I, exercise independent judgment. But but then we wouldn't need co most conflict of interest rules would not be necessary because because I could have a direct f material interest in in the disposition of a case and and I could be an arbitrator or a judge and say oh but it doesn't matter because even though uh, you know I have you know stocks worth a hundred thousand dollars at stake in this decision, you know, my sense of professional ethics is much more important to me than the value of my stock portfolio, so I'm just going to exercise independent judgment. So if we count on people's consciences, if we can count 100% on people's consciences, we, we really don't need conflict of interest rules. But I don't think that, you know, I don't think people have such a view of, of human nature that you're going to get legitimate, uh, you're going to get legitimacy outside of saying that what we ultimately just can rely on is, is a person's conscience, that regardless of what interest they have in, in how a matter is resolved, that when they take their oath to be an independent adjudicator or whatever, they will exercise independence of judgment. I mean, you know, I think the pervasiveness of conflict of interest rules in all legal systems that are based strongly on ideas of the rule of law suggests we can't just count on believing in people's independence of judgment. Yeah. Within the two possible scenarios, the one it got some settlement which it has to be there. Yeah. Either through domestic court or through the creation of some kind of supranational tribunal. We take the analogy with the example of Sam Walton, the Muslim court in the West, but they're both regional, not universal. Right. And from which uh, I, I mean envision in both scenarios, domestic court after the settlers of this type of dispute, having always investor having standing, not state to state, but investor to state. Or a creation of supranational tribunal. Which of the two 
possibility to have a more complex system to, to actually be implemented? What about EU or US side? Well, well you know, I don't agree with the critics who say there's no reason to have, you know, um, an international forum to resolve investment disputes, even between, quote unquote, developed countries that have the rule of law, because there's always the possibility of politicization and abuse of the rule of law, even in, in, in developed countries. And secondly, you know, my in instincts as a public international lawyer are such that I do think that there, 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 there ought to be international responsibility for abusive state conduct when it occurs in the economic sphere. The, the sphere of international economic relations is an important sphere of human relations. And to say that just because it's corporations that, you know, there are no norms of international justice that ought to apply at all it seems, you know, implausible to me. I mean, if you, if, if what you're really aiming at is, you know, uh, uh, an economic system that doesn't depend upon corporations and private investment, then fine, you know, reinvent Marxism or something like that. But if you have an ec economic system where it's expected and legitimate that that corporations will take risks, make major decisions, and operate uh, under, you know, uh, governmental authority with a view to profit, then, then manifest unfairness or abuse of government power. There's a, as a matter of justice ought, you know, to engage some level of international responsibility. And w international responsibility without an international forum seems to take us, you know, really very far backwards. And so it's those public international law instincts, not, you know, sort of pro-corporate instincts that drive me to say that we do need an international forum for resolution of investment disputes. I just think that we can do significantly better than the system that's developed. This being said, I want to make one thing, uh, you know, very clear about my sympathy with some of the critiques of investor state arbitration. I thought it got, I think it got going as a brilliant solution to try and depoliticize to some extent certain kinds of disputes between developed and developing countries at a time of north-south tensions during the Cold War and so on. It was, it was kind of a, a, you know, a very imaginative hybrid of concepts between international adjudication, commercial arbitration, and so on. And, and some of its defects are due to the difficulty of making such a hybrid workable. But we're in a different world now. There are a large number of these disputes. They often, you know, are not north-south, east-west type disputes. And, and, and the expectations, I think, of rule of law are, are much higher as we live in a post-Cold War, or as Ruchi Taital would say, humanity law type uh, uh, legal, legal framework. And so we need something different. And I, I don't believe that the system was started you know, to protect corporate interests or even out of the self-interest of the people in it. It just developed and the way it did. There's a large amount of path dependency. And we need to think out of the box today about doing things a little different. So I don't think we should demonize investor state arbitration or the people involved in it. Uh, you know, I'm just a little frustrated that, you know, that they can't see outside this world that, you know, in, in effect is a result of this path dependency to a new path uh, that we need to go on. Um, and um, I'm going to probably have to stop because I need to go to the airport. I, again, yeah. Can I invite everybody to give it up for Professor Thank you.